Hello, morning. Uh, thanks to Bruce that uh, introduced uh, our uh, speak uh, a little late, but uh, nevertheless, uh, once again, a good talk uh, to and the pleasure to be here to listen to um, Well, uh, João will be doing the technical part of this uh, talk. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I don't want to uh, jumping right away to the solutions or to have some kind of solution to something without first understanding the needs and the problem that we are trying to solve. So I will give you two slides. Well, actually there are four, but I will just uh, jump in two of them. Um, just to, to, to tell you what is teleperformance about so that you can understand the context. And, uh, and then Joan will follow with uh, the more technical part of it. Uh, so basic, basically, Teleperformance is a company in the customer experience managing industry. Um, the company was uh, a spin-off of a product company uh, of Altitude Software. I don't know if you know that. Uh, it, uh, the company that was created called uh, Plurimarketing. Then it was bought by the Teleperformance Group. Teleperformance Group is uh, the leader in customer experience management, and uh, we are talking about the subsidiary that we have in Portugal. So all the figures, are, everything that we are going to talk about is uh, about Teleperformance Portugal. Um, we have uh, more than 11, well, these figures are already uh, not updated, but we have more than uh, 100,000 people working with us. Um, we have uh, uh, 11 sites, so around uh, Lisbon, Setúbal, Covilhã, and Oporto, uh, serving more than 60 markets and with a portfolio of more than 100 uh, clients. Just to give you an example, uh, I cannot disclose the names, but uh, if you think about the top 10 um, capitalization uh, industry, uh, companies in the world, we are serving six of them uh, from here, from Portugal. Uh, besides that, we are serving in 36 languages. Uh, we have people from more than 80 countries working with us, but only serving on these uh, languages. Uh, basically, uh, with this digital world, what happened was that we understand that uh, uh, there are disrupting technologies uh, there are even more and more uh, digital interactions and digital, uh, digital solutions in the market. So we understand that we need to pursue a more technical, more digital uh, strategy. Uh, we defined three years ago this approach, this iTech, uh, uh, iTouch approach. Well, iTouch uh, because actually uh, we need uh, people. Uh, we believe that uh, people is the... Uh, strongest link that uh, makes the difference regarding the customer experience and also they are the key factors for innovation and security. And regarding the iTech, that is the point that is most relevant for this audience. Uh, basically, uh, we are betting in automation and when we are, we are talking about automation, it's not only to, to have some automated process, but also to uh, add uh, artificial intelligence, to add uh, additional knowledge in order to better serve and faster serve our uh, customers. Also analytics, because uh, uh, within analytics uh, we have a lot of data and uh, we need it not only for the operational performance but also uh, to getting some uh, information, some insights from that data. And of course then uh, all the omnichannel trend and all the technology and the system integration that we need to have in order to be able to serve our clients. So basically these are the, uh, the main drivers that we are following. Of course that we have uh, technology, technology centers around the world. In the last uh, year we bought a company in India that was called Intelinet. Uh, we bought them by one billion dollars uh, and they add up to the company not only the BPO business but also the automation and all these uh, components for artificial intelligence, and we are building up all this knowledge uh, internally, not only with the, uh, the learning, the empowered people to be able to uh, provide solutions on this technical part of this strategy. Uh, and now uh, I will pass uh, the, the, the micro to, 
to João because now he's going to uh, focus on the most technical part of the talk. So, mm -hmm. João, please take over the control. Okay, so um, in teleperformance, uh, we started recently a, a project about our recruitment uh, process. There was already a, um, a recruitment process in place uh, which used, um, which used a, a database, a backend, and there wasn't really a need of, of a front end because we used um, an outsourced software. There was a need, though, to build our own front end and establish our own internal user base. So um, classically, this is a kind of a, a classic backbone to any project, or at least uh, in, in our company, in the scope of our company. And there was uh, a necessity to separate uh, the developments into different and completely independent types of logic that work to a certain point without each other. Um, so we have our, our databases that contain uh, stored proce procedures, triggers, and uh, everything else for all kinds of um, operations on the data that we store. We have a backend, which is basically a set of microservices or web services or uh, an API that accesses that database and can be consumed by any front end we, uh, we choose. Um, and then the front end introduces the possibility of a user base, which is what we were looking for um, in regards to our recruitment process. So this is uh, an approach that we used. We use a lot of uh, .NET technologies. Um, and basically, our approach was always to have a single solution with uh, different kinds of projects in them for each of, the, each of these components. Um, we wanted to divide this. Uh, we wanted to make it so that uh, any developer could pick up just a single portion of a project and work on it without uh, communicating all that much with others, or at least um, uh, you know, be able to independently work through the, the component that he was working on. So we chose to separate it like this. Um, basically, we built an API in .NET Core uh, just so we could kind of follow our, our .NET theme. And for the front end, at the time, uh, we were debating about a few technologies. Uh, we, net, we ended up with uh, React, because myself had a, f um, a couple of years of experience with React, so why not bring that to the table and try to work something with uh, what was already in place in the recruitment project. So why is it good? Um, well, we found a few advantages. Um, these were the four main advantages that we found, or that, that are obvious. Uh, it's, it's declarative, um, by which I mean, in React, you describe what you want to render. You don't have to, to tell the browser how to do it. Uh, you can just simply, in your components, you can say, OK, I want this, and that, that is exactly what's going to appear. Um, this also means that the, the boilerplate code is greatly reduced. Um, there is some amount of configuration, but it's minimal. It has no component boilerplate that you have to generate. There's some setup involved, like I said, but when it comes to components, you can, you can express them, for instance, like pure functions. Um, the other advantage is uh, it's clear syntax. So uh, in React, uh, we don't actually code HTML, which apparently I've heard it's bad, but whatever. Uh, we code JSX, which is kind of HTML, but disguised as uh, HTML. There's no special syntax you have to learn because the JSX is exactly or almost identical to HTML, so you, you don't really need to learn much. Um, the learning curve is, uh, is very important when picking up a new UI framework. React has the least abstractions. So if you know JavaScript, then you can probably start writing React code in a day or something. Um, it takes time to pick up best practices, it's true. But, the, but you can, you're able to start right away if you, if you already are familiar with some of the front-end technologies. Uh, and it's functional. So React's greatest strength, um, I think, comes from the, the fact that 
you're, you're not even forced to use classes. You can just express all of your code uh, in, a, a pure, uh, in a set of pure functions, uh, if you so choose. Um, and and it, uh, it, it simplifies your code base, basically. So instead of me telling you why React is, is good, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a quick, uh, quick example uh, with code. So actually, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to open up my Visual Studio code. This is not it. So in order for you to start um, learning React and coding in React, there's actually, it's actually pretty simple. All you have to do basically is you have to install uh, Node.js. So you go to Node.js uh, website, you install it and you gain access to, um, you gain access to, to Node functionality. So I already have it installed, so if I, if I just do this, I will see that my Node version is at 11.15.0, uh, so I can use, uh, I can um, install um, a Create React app, which is a functionality that I need to auto-generate my React boilerplate. I already did this, so for instance, if you're looking to create another app, you simply do this command, and you say, insert name here, and what, what's gonna happen is your machine is gonna create a folder with everything you need to, to code in React. So it's pretty easy to, to start coding in React. And since I've already done this, I've created a, a folder named React Tutorial. I'm not sure if I have anything in here. No, it's empty. Um, so, there are a few considerations here. Uh, when you generate your first, the first React code, uh, all of these files are generated automatically, and also the source, uh, when it's generated, is not empty, the source folder. It has some files, but I've deleted them because I, I don't need them, I want to start from scratch. And our idea here is to uh, write some code inside of our source folder, oops, inside of our source folder, in order to create our React app. So for this, for, for, um, for testing, we're gonna start our development server. This is simply done by npm start. This will start my development server, and now I can uh, see what's going on uh, on my browser. So as you can see, there, there's an error there. Why is that? Because I have nothing on my source folder. So he's trying to find a, a, certain, a certain type of file, which is the index.js, and is not there. So I need to create it. This is basically the, the, what the browser is gonna, is gonna pick up from, the, from the, the application, and whatever I put on here is gonna render in the, the, H, the .html file, the index.html. So if you look at the, um, the index.html, this is just basic HTML. This is generated by Create React App. And the point is to render the entire application in this div ID root. So all of our application is gonna be rendered here. So I need to tell um, <laughs> React to, to put the entire application I create inside this div. How, I, how do I do this? Well, first, I'm gonna use the React library, of course, since we're coding in React. Uh, one thing to note, React is modular, so anytime I need to use some functionality that is not within this file, I need to import the module so I can use it inside of this file. So every file is isolated from each other if you don't do your imports and exports. Um, I also, since I'm communicating with the DOM, I will need the React DOM functionality. And from here, what I'm gonna say to the, to the application is, React DOM, please render something. Let's just say, hello world. 
And I want you to render this in the root uh, div, the, the div with the ID of root. So once I do this, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna take this element and I'm gonna render where the div with ID root is. So if I save this and I go to my browser, oops. Oh, I need to start my development server. So now when I do npm start, it should compile successfully. There you go. It automatically pops up um, a tab in my browser, and it says hello world. So this is, um, this is a React application. Very simple. It's a very simple hello world application. Now let's start to go a little bit deeper into um, what we actually can do in, in React. So. Of course, uh, when, you, when you build an application, you don't want to code every single aspect of your uh, application inside of this line. This, this would be bad practice. So um, by default, or by convention, I, I should say, uh, we should create a top-level component and render that component inside of this, instead of this div. So that top-level component, by convention, is gonna house every single other component and every single um, st structure uh, of your application. So, by convention, what we, what we do is we create a folder called components. And again, by convention, this file is usually called app.js. So this, this application is, or this file is gonna contain every single other um, component from our application. So again, this is just basic boilerplate. You need to import React, of course. Uh, by the way, as a side note, um, if you write JSX, um, you, uh, the browser won't understand or the application won't understand it's JSX unless you're using the React library because it's the React that will transform JSX into a clean uh, HTML or actually it's gonna turn it into JavaScript and the JavaScript's gonna turn it into HTML. So uh, right now I'm building my first component. As you can see the component is just a function that will return some amount of JSX. This looks like HTML but it's not. It's JSX that I've been talking about. This will be interpreted by React like something like React create element, it's a div, it has no properties, and it has, for instance, a string of hello world. If I put here, hello world. Uh, these lines of code are completely identical. So now if I do this, you'll notice that um, it's giving me a warning App is, this, is declared, but its value is never, used, is never read, and is assigned a value, but never used. Why is that? Because we're not exporting this, uh, this component, so it's pretty much isolated. In order for other files to use this component, we need to export it, and then import it in the files we want to use it in. So, this is basically all we need to do in order to use this component. So now I can reference this component, for instance here, where I want to render it, and I will, will import app from components app. So my component is located in my folder components, and the file name is called app. Notice that I, I didn't specify the, the extension of the file because React will interpret this as JS, as JavaScript. So now that I, I have imported my component app onto my um, root file, I can just use it as a component like this. So this is basically gonna render a component. Uh, notice that the, uh, the first letter is a capital letter. That's, uh, that's so that React can, um, can understand that it is a React component and, and not an HTML or a JSX element. So if I, if I wrote it like this, 
it would think that it's um, an HTML element or a JSX element, and it's not true. It's a, comp it's a React component. So there you go. Now, <clears throat> what if my user um, is not called world, and I want to put here his name? Like, for instance, my user's name John. I'm not going to say hello John if he's, if he's called like Joseph. So how do we actually communicate this through uh, to the component? Well, since uh, in React, it's good practice to uh, st structure your components uh, in a way that each component does just one thing that's part of the single responsibility principle. Um, we can create, it's good practice to create another component that will make that greeting for me. So why not create another component? Oops. So in here, this component is going to be responsible for greeting the user instead of my top-level component. And with this, all I need to do is And still works. Everything's working fine. Actually, I'm going to, I don't know how to zoom in, but whatever. Um, OK, so again, uh, there's a necessity that these components kind of talk to each other. And right now, that's not happening. I have, um, I have, I'm rendering the, the greeting component here, but I'm not telling it any special operation, or I'm not, I'm, I'm not passing any data to that component. So what I'm going to do is there's a way uh, that components talk to each other. Usually the, the parent component can speak to the, the children, the child components, and since the component greeting is being rendered in my app component, this is considered the child component, and the app is the parent component. So there's a way in which they communicate, which is the, uh, the props system. So this component now receives an argument which is, which is named props. These props contain uh, properties that I can pass to it, to, to the component when I render it anywhere. So for instance, I'm rendering greeting in my app component. I can pass a prop, for instance, name, and, and I'm gonna say the name of my user is John. So now I'm gonna receive it and props, by the way, is an object, so it has, it has keys. And one of, the, one of the keys that I'm passing is name. So if I access props.name, what I'm rendering is John instead of world. So um, another thing that I like to point out uh, about um, single responsibility principle is that we have a file called app.js and we have two components inside of that file. This is bad practice. What you should do is you should create another file with your greeting component. And then uh, import React, as always. This is just your typical boilerplate. And export this component. and then import it from here. Okay, so now they are in separate files. Um, this file is referencing the, uh, the greeting component, which is in its own file. And as you can see, things are still working. There is no, there's no error. This is, what, this is part of the, the best practice of, of React is separating your components, making sure a file only generates one component and a component should do one thing and do it well. That's part of, again, the single, the single responsibility principle. So, uh, of course, this is still um, really hard-coded in here, by which I mean that when a user loads up this application, it's just gonna say, hello, John. So how do I change that? Imagine that I'm a user that comes to my app and I want to change the name to my own name. 
Um, well, in the greeting, <clears throat> uh, we've looked at uh, a way to, to code um, components, which is, th this way is, is, this component is called a functional component since it's just a pure function. But there's another type of components, which are class-based components. Class-based components, um, they, do, they do have um, a, f a really interesting functionality, which is the state the state of a component, which is uh, basically an object where you can store information and tells the component how to behave. So what I want to do here is basically on my, let's say my top level um, component, I'm going to create an input here just so the user can uh, write its own name, and then the application will store that name somehow. So one way to do this is by state. So instead of having a functional component, we're, we are gonna use the state, and for that we need a class-based component. So I'm gonna rewrite this um, component as a class. Uh, this class will extend every functionality of a classic React component, and there's a few rules associated to this. First off, um, we need to, every, every component in React, every class-based component in React needs to implement the render method. This render method will, as the name suggests, uh, render any JSX that I put on here. So if I save, it's still working fine. So now, I have access to the, the state functionality. There are two ways in which I can declare state in a class-based component. I can either define a constructor, and just say on here, okay, I want this state to be an object with a name of empty string. This is a way we can define a state, and then we can manipulate a state anytime we want. The other way, which is absolutely equivalent to this and much more clean, is just to say state equals some object with a property name and an empty string. Uh, what React is doing is he's gonna look at this, um, look at the, the state declaration at the top, and he's, he's gonna rewrite it as a constructor. So the code that's here right now is exactly identical to the, the code I had earlier with the constructor and et cetera. So now I want a way for this input to manipulate the state however I please, however the user pleases when he's writing his own name. So for this, I'm gonna define uh, de define a, a on change method, and I'm going to say, okay, uh, when this input changes, please call a function called this on input change. And of course, this function is not defined, so let's define this function. So what, what do I want to do here um, specifically? I want to take the whatever the user inputs here and just say state, please change your name property to whatever the user inputs. So maybe most of you are wondering that this would be a good way to go. Um, well, it's actually changing the property name of this dot state, which is this. But what does that what does that say? Do not mutate state directly. Use state. Okay, this is because you shouldn't you should you should never alter the state. You should never mutate the 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 state object 
in your React because there are a lot of functionality in React that uses a previous state. So it ne that information needs to be stored. So if you're changing what's stored in memory, there's no access to what was previously there. You just lost it completely. So the idea here is to create a whole new object and pass it to uh, your current state. Um, React.components already implements a method that helps you do this. So the method is setState. And this method will accept an object with the properties you want changed. So now if I do this, um, when I receive, when there's a change on my input, I call on input change. I'm gonna grab the event, I'm gonna take the value, and I'm gonna store it in name. So let's see if this works. I get an error because, and this is important, when I call uh, this on input change, this keyword is not referencing my class. The context is changed here. This, um, this keyword is actually referencing the input field. So how do, I, how do I bind this function to my class? There, there are two ways to do this. One of them is in the constructor, you can bind it like, and I'm gonna show you. So you have your boilerplate, and on here you can say something like, I want, to, I want this function to be equal to the same function, but I want to bind it to this context. And while we're at it, we're gonna put the state up here. So what I'm doing here is, in order for the context never to be lost, uh, lost when I use the this keyword, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bind the function to this context, to the class context, and now I'm, I'm, I'm always gonna be sure that the context is never gonna be lost, uh, regardless where I call this dot on input change. So now, now it works. It's not giving me an error. And I'm assuming it's altering the, the, the state, but we're gonna look at that in just a moment. So the other, uh, the other way would be, instead of defining a method um, to handle the input changes, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna define the narrow function. A narrow function is basically um, the, the main difference between an arrow function and a method is that um, regardless, it never loses context. So I can always reference this, this, um, this arrow function with this keyword and I'm, sh I'm gonna be sure that the context will never be lost. It's always gonna be the class. So now if I try this again, it still works. It's not giving me an error. Now, how do I make sure that the state is actually changing? Well, instead of passing just a string here of John, I can pass this.state.name. And now, whenever the state of a component is changed, the component will re-render itself. So basically what I'm expecting is, whenever I input something in my input field, I'm gonna change the state to whatever I put on, it, on there, and the component will re-render with that state. So as you can imagine, now the state is empty, but if I type something, it's rendering whatever I type in there. Okay, so. Um, this, this gives you kind of a, a, 
kind of uh, an idea of how things communicate in React and how you can scale this into a much larger application, of course. There are a few things that I can change here. Uh, I can refactor this to work in a more effective way. For instance, this, as I told you, the app component by convention is your top level component. So every other component is gonna be rendered inside here one way or another. Whether they'd be nested on some other components, well, you can see how, how this can kind of grow in scale. So one, one thing that I can do here, instead of having all this logic in a component called app, I can, I can pretty simply uh, create a component called simple form because it's just an input and it's, it's not doing much. So instead of having all this logic here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy all of this logic in my simple form. And now this form is, um, is responsible for actually doing all that thing with the, with the input and whatever. So uh, I do need my greeting here. And I do need to export it. And in my app, I can remove all of this. I can go back to actually just using a um, functional component. And in here, I can return the simple form. And of course, I need to make sure I'm gonna import it. Okay. Um, actually, I'm not exporting this correctly. This is the simple form. So now, what I did was I basically refactor it for readability. So, of course, you don't have, ideally, you, you don't have any logic in your top-level component. Um, basically, your top-level component, which is the app component, is gonna be an entry level of some sort. Um, an entry point for the app to render every single other component. So this is just part of the, the best practices um, of, of React. So if I go back there, things should still work as intended. So you can imagine how this can grow uh, pretty big um, in terms of scale. Um, this, this application is extremely simple. But if I want to input some, if I want to put some other inputs in there, I, I can do so. I can refactor this input to be a, a, a component, uh, and I can reuse that component everywhere I need a, a field input, and so on and so forth. Um, this was what we used on our recruitment um, platform. It's all written in React, and it follows, uh, and, and it follows a similar structure. Um, uh, what I mean by this is if I continue to, to grow this application uh, in the course of a few weeks maybe, it will look like a massive application and, and it, it will be able to do everything basically you want. So uh, I, I'm hoping that this kind of gives you a few lights on why uh, we chose React. Um, this is, of course, a uh, extremely simple uh, example, just to kind of understand um, how how scalability works and how reusability works, and how we were looking for those main advantages. And yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Ron.